Yeah, so my name is Max Takei. I'm an academic clinical fellow with the University of Oxford, and I share my time between doing research um, and seeing patients with uh, mental illness. Okay, so um, you're a medical doctor, but I did some um, some quick Googling, and you have a PhD in um, is it biomedical engineering? That's right. Yeah, I've done my PhD in, in engineering, developing techniques for brain imaging. Okay. Cool. So you're not actually a psychiatrist yourself, but you're working in the uh, Department of Psychiatry? No, I'm not training to become a psychiatrist. You are so, in training? Okay. Yep. Awesome. So I've, I've done my medical degree after my PhD in engineering. Yeah, right. Um, hopefully you got a scholarship so you don't have to pay lots of tuition fees because that would be very expensive. <laughs> <good. laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much for your time. I'm really interested in uh, long COVID and it's... Um, yeah, it's such an int intriguing area uh, that I think that um, we're only still scratching the surface of. Um, I'm wondering though, are there aspects of long COVID that sort of surprise you? Well, I think, um, I guess from our study, um, we sort of knew before we um, did the study that long COVID was a thing, that um, people were experiencing symptoms that were various and affecting different systems of the body. Um, um, for a while after COVID, but what we were unsure is um, whether that would manifest in people seeking medical help for those symptoms. So what I mean by that is um, a lot of the studies before our study were based on self-report surveys of, um, of those symptoms. Now, if you survey your colleagues about who has a headache today, you will probably see that quite a lot of them have a headache. They might not have had coffee, they might have had a poor night, sleep, etc. But they don't seek medical attention for that because that's sort of part of our sort of, I guess, Western life uh, or way of life. And we sort of get used to it. And there is a big difference and big leap bit between that and seeking med medical attention for those symptoms to the extent that those are recorded then in the electronic health records. So, so I, in a way, we were surprised by the, um, the extent to which um, people after a diagnosis of COVID were experiencing those symptoms to the extent that it would seek medical attention for them. Because one of the things that you observed was that about almost 40% of patients with long COVID symptoms recorded at three to six months didn't have these same problems or at least weren't diagnosed in the first three months. Um, I'm wondering if perhaps some of them might have had those problems throughout their first six months, but just didn't get them looked at because they hoped that they would go away. And when they hadn't gone away, they did seek medical attention or whether these are truly new incidences of, of, of problems that occur, you know, three to six months after the, the infectious uh, period. It's an excellent point. Um, I think we, we, we cannot say um, with electronic health worker data, which of those two is 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 the correct um, the correct answer? And you're completely right, and um, uh, that they might not have sought medical attention for for, for them in in the first six months, in the first three months. I would add to that that there's also a possibility that in the first three months they might have seek, sought medical attention for those symptoms, but the medical practitioner would have said, "Well, that's COVID. You know, you've 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 you you're just having COVID." Um, Whereas, you know, when they seek medical attention in three to six months, that then gets encoded in different ways, because at least at the time when we did the study, when, well, at the time where the data was collected, long COVID was not really a thing yet, um, which means that clinicians would not have thought that this might be related to COVID. They were just encoding it as, well, we, we don't know, you've got a headache. Let me type in your medical record that you've got a headache, but I can't quite pinpoint what the cause of that headache might be. Yeah, and so... Where we, um, where there is like a diagnosis, this wouldn't be just one episode of headache. Um, you would be uh, getting a diagnosis for persistent headaches. You know, this would be something unusual, wouldn't it? Well, it's, it's difficult to know exactly the behavior of, of individual clinicians. Um, in my own practice, I, I, would, I would think that um, um, we wouldn't um, encode a headache if somebody just says, oh, and by the way, I've got a bit of a headache this today, but might just be lack of coffee. Uh, I don't think anybody would sort of code that. Uh, but what exactly is getting coded is difficult, to, is difficult to say. So that's one limitation of that type of data, which is that we, we, we don't know exactly, um, um, you know, whether those are persistent symptoms, um, whether they are severe symptoms, or whether they're just symptoms that for whatever reason, the clinician thought 
were worth mentioning in the patient's medical records. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the uh, differences that you observe between uh, influenza and, and COVID in, in terms of the, the persistent symptoms. Yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's one big part of the study, which is that we, we compared the cohort of patients with COVID to the cohort of patients with, with influenza. Um, and what we found by and large is that the type of symptoms that patients experience after the flu, so after an influenza infection, um, in the three to six months is, are quite similar to, the, to the, sim the symptoms that patients experience after COVID. So it's not that there are specific symptoms that only occur after COVID and never occur after influenza. But they do occur a lot more after COVID than after influenza, about 50% times more, uh, so 1.5 times more uh, to put it that way. Um, that in a way is a surprising number in, in, in two ways. It's surprising because it sort of validated the fact that there's a, such a thing as long COVID um, um, and that, or that at least patients are experiencing um, symptoms in the three to six months after COVID much more than after uh, another infection, but it's not 10 or 100 times more. Um, and so it might be, um, that certainly is a possibility from our study that it's sort of a long flu concept, if you will, has, has been overlooked um, and that patients after the flu might not recover as quickly as, as we might think. Um, and that they might in the three to six months after the illness still experience um, um, symptoms, but it's uh, to a lesser extent than after, after COVID, according to our data. Yeah, my, my sort of feeling with flu is that often... Um, it may be undiagnosed anyway. Um, people may have a, you know, a, a viral upper respiratory uh, infection that just gets put down as a, a, a viral illness um, with unknown etiology. <laughs> yeah, you're completely right. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an important point, which is that the, the data that we have where we use diagnostic codes for influenza and for COVID are um, probably enriched for um, um, more severely affected patients. What I mean by that is that compared to the whole population who's got the flu at some point in, during the 2020 season, um, we probably captured those that were severely um, 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 affected enough that they made it to the electronic health record. That also probably applies to, to COVID. Um, quite a lot of people would have had COVID without noticing it, or they would have had a, 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 a test at the testing center. Um, um, and not necessarily a clinician um, as a result of that. And so as a result of that, it might, it might be, and it depends from practice to practice, but it might be that this does, then does not get carried through to the, to the electronic health records. And the reason, one hint that we have at the fact that this might be the case is that the hospitalization rate, so the number of people who get hospitalized um, at the time of the COVID-19 illness in our data is about 20%. And that's a lot more than, than the general population. So it seems that both the flu group and, and the COVID group in our data were both um, more severely affected than the general population would have been with, with those infections. Okay. So I, I see that the study talks about um, the risk for uh, long COVID being higher uh, among those who are hospitalized for, for COVID-19. Um, and so that's the uh, looking at risk on an individual um, basis. But then if you look at um, the sort of population risk, if you can talk about it like that, um, uh, clearly uh, the hospitalized segment is, is quite small compared to the overall um, group of people uh, affected by COVID. So um, when we think about long COVID sufferers, are they more likely to be people who had a, a mild to moderate um, SARS-CoV-2 infection? So that's a, that's a good point. If I understand your question correctly is, in a way in our data, um, those who were more severely affected were more likely to suffer the, um, um, any long COVID symptom. But, but by and large, people are not severely affected. And so the bulk of patients with long COVID would be people with relatively milder infection. You're completely right. Um, and so, and so, so yes, so, so, so overall, um, and actually the difference between the, the most severely affected patients and not so severely affected patients was again, not, you know, a tenfold ratio. It's, you know, a 50% increased risk or 40% increased risk, depending on how you, um, how you define um, 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 severity. Actually, if you define severity based on being hospitalized, which is quite severe enough um, at the time of your COVID-19 um, illness, that's only, um, that, that brings the risk of long COVID symptoms 
only um, um, by a factor of 1.2, increases by a factor of 1.2. So not, not at all a tenfold increase. So, so the risk of long COVID symptoms um, is quite high in people, even if they do not have to, to go to the hospital for COVID. Were you able to see any um, long COVID phenotypes, like different patterns of um, manifestation, particularly you know, from uh, those that were hospitalized versus non-hospitalized? Yes, we certainly did. So we, we found that um, 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 those who were hospitalized, for instance, um, had more, um, were more likely to suffer um, with cognitive problems, so what we call brain fog, but less likely to suffer headaches, for instance. Um, so, so what that really means, and that's quite striking if you, if you think of it, what that means is if you, if you had a milder version of COVID, you're more likely to have headaches um, in, in the three to six months after COVID, and that's quite striking. Um, and similar differences were, well, not similar, but the differences were also seen between, say, men and women. So the difference in absolute risk of having a COVID symptom, a long COVID symptom, um, was similar between the two. Women were slightly more, more at risk, but not, but, but not um, substantially so. But they were much more likely to suffer um, 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 headaches, um, more likely to suffer myalgia, so muscle aches. Uh, but less likely to suffer um, abno um, um, abnormal breathing, so breathing problems and cognitive problems than men were. Um, and so we, we found those sort of different profiles of symptoms between different subgroups of the population. Um, I guess the question is, you know, what is the, the mechanism um, driving these particular differences? Uh, and, and your research uh, that was um, presented in this study uh, didn't really look at that, but um, do you have any thoughts on, on what might be the underlying biological? Yeah, so, so, so you're right that we can't really tell the mechanism using, using the sort of data that, that we have. We need sort of uh, better data, um, uh, prospective studies where you can actually follow individual patients and then ask them specific questions. Um, but um, I mean, there's two, I guess there's two mechanisms. There's one that might be very interesting. There's one that's, that's completely mundane in a way. The mundane mechanism to start with that one is that um, the baseline rate of those symptoms in those different subgroups is, is, um, is, 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 is different. So if we talk about men and women, it might well be that men have more cognitive problems than women and women have more headaches than men. And so that gets reflected in the data because obviously the data captures not only symptoms of long COVID that occur as a, as a direct result of COVID, but also as, as a result of, of the baseline rate. So that's the not, sort of not interesting explanation, if you will, but very, very, very possible. Um, not really explaining the difference between hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients because those were um, very similar at baseline. Um, but there are some, some other uh, possibilities. There are possibilities that one, one possibility, if I, if I talk about hospitalization, for instance, is that the, the cognitive problems that occur as a result of, of, of long COVID, uh, as a result of COVID, might be due to um, um, small hypoxic injury to the brain. So the brain is not receiving enough oxygen during a particular time, and that sort of causes those um, cognitive problems down the line. Um, and, and we've got evidence from other studies that that's the case. So, so there's, been, there's been a study by um, one study by um, Adam Hampshire. Uh, in the UK, where he's been, well, his group has been following the, the cognitive symptoms of patients after COVID. And, and what they found is that if you were more severely affected in terms of your respiratory system, so you, you were more short of breath at the time of your COVID-19 illness during the acute phase, you're more likely to have um, cognitive problems down the line. Um, and so there might be that this is the mechanism driving some of those symptoms and other mechanisms might be then driving other symptoms, which are then more reflected in milder cases of COVID. What about with the headaches? Do you think there could be some vascular component? There might be, but then again, you would, you would expect in that case that that would be more common in, in, in more severely affected patients. And it's the opposite that we see. Um, you know, one possibility that we, ne we need to keep in mind, that's something that actually has been um, 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 sort of under the spotlight more recently, which is don't put everything down to, the, to long COVID. And that's important. So if a patient comes to, um, comes to the hospital with, with a headache, say, um, and they've had, they've had COVID two months ago or three months ago, it's important to investigate that headache fully and not to put it down to long COVID. And one possibility where, um, um, is that if you've had very severe COVID, 
then you're more likely to receive the right, so to speak, diagnosis for your headache. It might be that you've had a bleed in your brain, for instance, to take a very you know, severe, severe example. Whereas that, that, can, that gets misdiagnosed if you've, if you've had sort of a less severe form of COVID. That's one possibility. I don't know how valid it is, but, but it might be that sort of dynamics at play as well. And we need to be at, uh, um, uh, paying attention to those. Um, I, I see that you have an interest in the UK biobank um, data. Uh, and of course, we saw that really interesting preprint that came out from your colleagues. Um, uh, do you have any, um, any thoughts on, on that paper and how that may relate to the research that you've done? Yes, I suspect you re you're referring to the, to the paper where they've looked at pre versus post um, COVID brain imaging um, study. Well, that's, a, that's an absolutely fantastic and fascinating study that I wasn't involved in, where for the first time they were able, because of the, uh, the capability of the UK Biobank, to look at the brain of patients after they've recovered from or after they've had COVID compared to before. So it's not just looking at a group that didn't have COVID and a group that did have COVID. They were very much able to follow the same patient before and after, and after COVID. And what they found is that they, they had, there were some differences in the brain after COVID and that's alarming, but in a way that might also be explaining some of the symptoms that we see, um, not least the, the cognitive problems, but also quite a, quite a lot of the, um, the neuropsychiatric presentations such as mood changes and uh, anxiety, for instance, that was one of the most prevalent symptoms that we've seen in our, in our data. Yeah, so in your study, you didn't have, um, you, you weren't looking at um, COVID sufferers versus people uh, during the same period who didn't have COVID as controls. So we used controls, as controls, we used people with um, the flu, so influenza. Exactly. And they had the flu during the pandemic. Um, right. So, so that, that was an important aspect because um, for some symptoms, and, and obviously the, the one that comes to mind first is uh, anxiety and depression. This is very much influenced by the pandemic as well. So it was important that uh, regardless of the fact that uh, patients had or did not have COVID. So it was important for us to have a group of controls who had another health event, in this case, influenza, during the pandemic, um, because, because they were, in a way, sort of going through the pandemic as their sort of COVID peers, if I can put it that way. Um, and, so, and, and, and so they were, you know, suffering the same sort of um, um, impact of lockdown, um, economic austerity, uncertainty, et cetera, on their mental health. Yeah, so where do you go from here? What's your next uh, lot of research going to look at? So I think what we desperately need now um, are, two, are two things. Um, we need to understand mechanisms and we need to understand treatment, um, the, be the best treatment um, uh, for that. So, um, so, so in order to understand the mechanism, we need to move away from the sort of study that I'm, I've been doing. I mean, they, they will still play a role in understanding other things, but um, um, and it can inform the sort of other studies that we need to do. But as I was saying, we need to do what we call prospective studies where we can actually clearly define what sort of questions, what sort of tests do we want to run on, on different patients. Um, and there is a study in the UK called FOSP COVID, which is trying to do exactly that. And that's following patients, not just the electronic health records, but also um, um, doing um, um, some brain imaging on them, doing some blood tests, um, 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 but also doing some actual cognitive testing, um, exercise testing, testing, et cetera, just to, just to have a much deeper understanding of what's going on in those people's bodies. Um, uh, to understand the mechanisms. And that will um, hopefully inform how to best treat those, those symptoms. What are the best, the best um, drugs or, or non-pharmacological treatments um, for those patients? I think those are the two priorities that I will be focusing on. Yeah, what about you yourself? What are you doing? So I'm, 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 I'm hoping to be involved in that um, um, first COVID study and using, using some of that data. Um, I will continue to use the, uh, the sort of data that we've been using from the Trinetics network to inform the sort of studies that, um, that we do. So it's, it's sort of, it can, it, there can be some synergies between, between the, sort of, um, the sort of data that, we are, that we're using. Um, and um, and I, that's, gonna be my, that's gonna be my focus for the next six months. Right. <laughs> Excellent. And do you think you'll be needing to work closer with neurologists, immunologists, uh, infectious diseases, uh, experts? Like, do you, do you sort of see this as being um, 
much more multidisciplinarian um, in terms of the approach to untangling this? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's crucial. Um, so, so we are psychiatrists. So we got into into that sort of studies because we were initially interested in in the psychiatric consequences of COVID, and that was the first paper that we published on on, on that. Um, then a, 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 a neurologist joined the team, Masood Hussain, um, who's a neurologist and is a co-author co on the paper. And so we brought the sort of neurology to it, and then we sort of thought, well, actually we can just apply the same strategies, the same sort of research approach to investigate lung COVID. That's how we got into lung COVID. But you're completely right that lung COVID is such a multidisciplinary um, thing. It's a, such a, it affects so many systems of the body that you need to have a deep understanding of, of the different systems. So we do liaise, even though they're not necessarily co-authors on the paper, but we do um, liaise with a lot of um, infectious disease specialists, public health specialists, um, and uh, to to understand um, to, to better well to better understand what it is that we are that we are looking at and measuring. Mm. Max, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you wanted to mention before I let you enjoy the rest of your morning? I think I think we've covered quite a lot. I'm I'm pleased that we've had a chance to discuss the limitations of the study, which is always very important because it's it's a large study and so it's got many advantages to it. But it's also important to understand the limitations of the data and and the need for additional research as well. Okay. Yeah, because um, I saw you kind of referenced the Veterans Affairs um, uh, studies that have come out from um, St. Louis, and uh, and I think that those studies have been really interesting as well. But obviously, uh, that's you know men are overrepresented in in, yeah. <laughs> in that database. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's such an intriguing area. Are, are there are there sort of what, what are your big questions, um, if you like, you know, are, are they just to do with mechanism? I think so. I think, I guess, you know, you, you, we can try and, and, you know, blindly to apply treatment. Um, and it's not to say, I'm, I'm not saying that in a derogative way at all. You know, it's, it, for instance, we know that um, there are some um, clotting problems, coagulation problem in COVID. So it's not unreasonable to try an anticoagulant as a, as a way of, of, of treating it. We know there's a, a massive inflammatory component to COVID. So it's not unreasonable to try um, an anti-inflammatory drug to uh, prevent or treat uh, lung COVID symptoms. Um, so it is, it, is, it is fine and, and there are some people doing that. But I think having a deep understanding of the mechanism involved and that's what's going to aid sort of drive science um, um, forwards, because we might then find that some of those mechanisms are shared um, in, in different uh, infections. You know, we were talking about sort of potential long flu concepts. Well, it might be that some of the mechanisms are shared with the flu, and they might explain why people after the flu sometimes also experience um, uh, long symptoms. Um, and, and, but it's, it would certainly also help us understand um, and pinpoint and define new treatments specifically dedicated for um, for those symptoms. And I think for patients, understanding what's going on um, is, is therapeutic in and of itself. I mean, I, I don't want to undermine the, obviously the, the role of actual therapeutics, but, um, but I think what we're seeing in, in patients with lung COVID and the patients with lung COVID that I'm, that I'm seeing is, is that there's this big question mark about what the hell is going on? You know, why am I feeling the way I'm, I am? And I've just had COVID and it was not even that bad. Um, and I think and it, and it, it sort of empowering those patients by saying, look, this is what we think is going on. Now let, let, let's, do you want to join force and, and do research to better, um, to better, to even better understand it and, and start treating it. And I think that's, that's very important and critical. Awesome. I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time. It was great to Thank meet you. Thank you very much for your time. Great to meet you too.